Welcome back to the Mob Mentality Show. I'm Chris Lucian and my co-host is Austin Chadwick. And today we are pleased to have Mary and Tom Poppendick uh, to talk to us about outcomes, not outputs, and uh, the single-threaded leader or responsible engineer. And so uh, Mary and Tom, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves and we can get started. Okay, well, very quickly, I started programming in 1967. I had held various jobs, mostly in control of instruments, press engineering type programming, um, that sort of thing. I was an IT manager in a manufacturing plant when we did with some of the early just-in-time stuff before there was a word called lean. Um, I retired from 3M in, in 98 and got involved in agile programming and wrote a book in 2000, which was published in 2001. And uh, it went over pretty well. That's called Lean Software Development and subsequently published three more books. And uh, now, you know, it's been quite a few years, maybe 60 since I wrote my first code. So we're trying to be retired. My first code was my PhD thesis in physics for uh, surface physics at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I taught in the university uh, physics and taught programming as well, including digital electronics, uh, microprocessor programming at the time, and um, have been in various roles um, as uh, first day uh, project work and uh, consultant. Um, into object-oriented programming back in the 90s when that was a big thing. And um, when the 2001 crash happened, um, I decided to join Mary in our current endeavor. And so we have been pursuing this retirement hobby now for 20-some uh, years. And it has been a real thrill. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, you know, I really, I really love, uh, love the book and uh, use it all the time. So, cool. um, uh, so let's talk about uh, outcomes and not outputs. Um, you know, what are your thoughts there? And uh, maybe okay. we can start a dialogue around it. So um, I really think that the biggest problem with, if you think about Agile in, in my perspective, having started programming as a teenager in 67, Agile is new to the to me. It's only 20 years old instead of the 60 since I first wrote code. I did a ton of software development long before there was such a thing. And um, it has some flaws, which people don't like to admit, but I would say the biggest flaw that seems to have evolved is it focuses on getting stuff done, not on making sure that the people who are using the software have got the kind of outcomes that they're hoping for and expect. And um, I believe that comes from the legacy of information systems in general, because IT departments started out automating business processes. You know, before there were many computers and microprocessors, that's kind of what all computers were for was to automate banking processes. When I was a kid, I went to the bank with a paper book and they hand wrote in that I put some more money in and hand wrote in my balance. So that was quite a big thing to automate that process with, with uh, software. Um, but when it gets to the mm, 80s, we started automating engineering processes. That's where I did a lot of my work. When it came to the 90s, especially towards the end, we started getting internet. And all of a sudden, we weren't automating business processes anymore. We were we were basically putting our software into products. Now, if you did an engineering program, you were doing that for a long time, but if you did IT software, uh, you weren't. So the history and legacy of people in IT departments is that their customers are their colleagues in the business and their colleagues in the business determine what they should do. And I believe that Agile was built on that history and that theory and uh, because of that, there's an intermediary, some maybe the business or some person or maybe a product owner or whoever the heck that goes between 
the engineering team, and I'm going to call us software engineers, the engineering team, and the thing that they're trying to achieve. And that is the biggest problem. And because of that, there's two things. I mean, I remember when I first mentioned this back in around 2001, 323, I was criticized because they said, you know, uh, that you want the software developers to take the blame when things go wrong. And that's not right. We're trying to remove them from any blame. And I'm thinking, and you also remove them from any glory. Because if you are not deciding what to do and it's massively successful, it wasn't because you did something great. It was because somebody told you something great to do. And um, I'm not used to that because that is not the way we ran the engineering departments where I coded software. And um, so the concept that um, we're not measuring output, we're measuring outcomes is easy to say, but it's not actually what a whole lot of even agile development processes do. So what you look for is a proxy between the team and the customer using the software or the consumer using the software. And they're very common. And, and sometimes they're even like sort of important. But if we go back to the days when I was doing software in products, there I did two major roles in 3M was, one was to program engineering software, which control manufacturing plants themselves, the equipment in it. And the other was to work in a division selling products that had some sort of software in them. And let's go to the second one. In 3M at the time in the 80s, 90s, it was extremely famous for massive amounts of new products being put on the market all the time. And the, the whole, you know, you could be a great employee if you were involved in a brand new product. That was like what everybody wanted to do. So the teams that were formed, and there were teams, but the teams that were formed around a product always were mini uh, startup businesses. Okay, so there was a champion that would be equivalent to a startup business CEO. There was a marketing person of some sort. There was a tech lead of some sort. Um, and in fact, if you were doing a hardware product, you also had to have a tech service lead because you needed to have the tech service manual done. Uh, if you were doing a, a sort of software for a process, you might have a process engineering lead. There was a quality person and always a manufacturing person because you had to manufacture something. And um, that was what our teams looked like. And the team as a group was responsible for putting a, and in, in 3M, what we wanted was high margin products. We were not going for high volume or high revenue. We were going for high margins on the theory that if every product you have is profitable, you can have a whole lot of them and a whole lot of profit. <laughs> and also on the theory that you wanted to constantly, because we built a lot of our products on, um, on patents, okay? Patents run out. So you need to constantly refresh and have new product ideas because when your patent ran out, you want your company to be running on stuff that's still patentable. So you have to constantly replace your products. So um, our teams then had, as, had on them every single product team, a controller. Now the controller was a relatively junior person, probably equivalent to like a senior engineer. They were another team member. But when we were going to an operating committee making a presentation, the presentation always revolved around the pro forma PL projection for the product. That was what governed everything that we did. So are we building towards a high margin product? It wasn't, is the technical team done this much stuff? Or did they do what the marketing people wanted? Or anything like that. It was, what's the manufacturing cost going to be? You know, what's the support cost going to be? What percent of sales is it going to take to sell this? Uh, and will people buy it? And what will they be willing to pay for it? And will it really solve the problem we think it will? And, um, and then you put a little bit, we, we had this thing called um, make a little, sell a little. We put a little bit on the market, see how it worked, improve it, put a little bit more in the market. Very, very iterative process. And our whole mantra was, we had lots of mantras, but one of them was make a little, sell a little. 
And um, so everything from post-it notes to you name it started out as lots of small experiments. And the team behind those experiments, if they turned out to be massively successful, got to run that business. So it was a real true startup team concept. Um, and then when I saw Agile, it was like a huge step backwards mm. because this team didn't own responsibility for the success of the product in the market on the customer site. There was always this sort of proxy in between, not always, but almost all the time. And if you look at the biggest, biggest sort of loss or failure or waste in software development, it's building stuff that's the wrong thing, that wasn't what people really wanted. And um, if you take, it's not just an iterative approach that keeps you from doing that. It's an iterative approach that's delivered to the customers with a feedback cycle, which governs what happens next. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that whole feedback cycle, then the team cannot be responsible for outcomes. And so instead we make them responsible for outputs. Now we don't count lines of code anymore. We count stories instead. Well, okay, feature stories. The, the fundamental thing is anybody who's ever done any serious amount of software knows that the bigger your code base, the worse it is, okay? I mean, it's a mess. And the more stuff in there, the more junk in there, the harder it is to maintain, okay? And yet we count how much junk we put in our code base as good. Makes no sense. No concept of productivity there. What you need to do is say, have I done something that actually moves this product forward in the marketplace? Yeah. And um, if you have a controller doing a PL and you happen to be in the, the laboratory that's doing the chemistry, then what you're trying to do is lower the, the materials cost or the manufacturing cost because your margins depend upon cost and ability to sell. But if you're in the engineering department that's determining the capabilities of the product, you always, always find test customers to check it on, deliver it to, figure out what they think about. We had um, teams um, that were product teams, very, very many of them, lots of them. And the marketing person on the products team job was to bring the technical people on the team to meet customers so that they could understand what the customers wanted because we didn't really we didn't really expect the marketing person to have a good technical description of what the customer wanted it wasn't their job and so our our concept was to put the technical people in touch with the customers and it didn't matter that it wasn't all the customers it mattered that it was a representative customer or a lead customer. And that lead customer, and that was the job of the marketing or sales type crew to figure out how to get that message from these lead customers to the rest of the team developing the product. And I don't see enough of that in um, the agile world, not nearly enough. And even today, 20 years later, somehow that just still seems to be missing. Yeah, yeah, I have um, um, up in front of me is, uh, you know, an image of uh, what we were talking about, where you even want to minimize the output, right, uh, to maximize oh, yeah. the outcome. The fewer it, features, the better. There's no yeah. question. <laughs> uh, it, you can't count features as good. Yes. <laughs> They're only good if you've proven that they've added something of true value to the customers. Otherwise, they're bad. And yet we don't have that final check. Yeah. Does this really make the product more useful, yep. more friendly, uh, less expensive, whatever, so that it's easier for the customer to use and more towards helping them meet their goal. And you can't count that feature until you've done that. And it doesn't matter that somebody says it will do that. It doesn't matter who says it will do that. It matters that customers actually do it because guessing what customers are gonna want with something that doesn't even exist is really not a particularly useful exercise and nobody does it well. And we shouldn't even expect people to do it well. Guessing what customers might want so that we can test it, that's the job. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, so uh, I've been uh, on social media quoting uh, many of your books. So thank you for that. <laughs> and 
I, you know, anytime I quote the book, um, the one that has the tagline, results aren't the point. Correct. I almost always get a comment back saying, what? You know, like results aren't <laughs> the point, you know? <laughs> like, what are they talking about? How can results not be the point? And I think you're kind of hitting at what you're talking about now, right? By results, meaning products, features, enhancements, specs, requirements, all the all the in-between things instead of the outcomes. Uh, yeah. Well, part of that actually had to do, do you have a mechanism system structure in place that will routinely produce uh, good stuff? Results mm -hmm. aren't an accident. They do fall back on having a good underlying mechanism to do stuff. But we've been too big on mechanisms and processes and not big enough on what they're supposed to be doing with those mechanisms and processes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that, that's, uh, uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, but, but at one is... point you and I had, uh, I, I had asked you, uh, we talked a little bit about DevOps and then you kind of gave me a, de a definition of what DevOps, uh, is to you. Um, and you'd mentioned that, you know, at the very end of the process, DevOps also means getting feedback from, from the end of the pipeline. Um, and I really liked that. Uh, and, you know, previously at previous work environments, and even when I started where I am now, uh, I, it was really funny because it was just like, do we have any of this information? It's like, oh, well, no. And it's like, okay, well, like, what's a one liner that we can just get something back so that we can actually prove, prove something and have a discussion yep. about um, that data. And, uh, and so, you know, and later down the line, heat maps and things came along, but a lot of times it's just store a record in the database whenever this thing happens. And, and then now we can talk about how often it happens and whether or not this should even be a feature anymore. Um, so I like to ask when people have teams, we'll, we'll use the word teams, how, whatever you want to call that group of people, how do teams know what to do? And I very often, when I start talking with companies, that's the first thing I ask them. How do teams know what to do? Yeah. Now, hint, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, they've just deployed something, they get some feedback based on what they deployed and they use that to decide what to do next. And I almost never get that, yeah. never. It's just not there. And the very first thing I look for in an organization is how do teams know what to do? Mm -hmm. And, um, and it depends on, are they looking at outcome or outputs? If they're looking at outcome, they know what to do because what they're trying to do is improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're looking at the outcome of the latest thing that they deployed. And it doesn't have to be something that's really fast, but it does have to be something where the loop goes all the way to the user usage of some sort and then comes back to the team that's figuring out how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't matter that there's somebody facilitating the movement of the information, but they should not be a person who's a channel. Yeah, so, so, so from, like uh, a product owner or product manager as a feature curator for- Right, a, so for product managers MT. are really not feature curators. They've been around for many more decades than Scrum, mm -hmm. and they've always been sort of like, you know, responsible for understanding the product and making sure that the team understands the product. And the product literature in the 90s on product managers, for sure, didn't put them as somebody deciding what the team would do. There was just no concept of that until we had this thing called product owner come in and be responsible for making decisions on the priorities of what the team worked on. Now, when I was an engineer working on, um, you know, automating processes in a manufacturing plant, uh, for somebody to tell our engineering team what our priorities were, would have been a deep insult. I mean, look, we're the engineers. We do the control systems for this plant. Somebody who doesn't do control systems can't possibly tell us the priorities of what way to do things and what order to do things and how to make things happen. That's our job. Mm -hmm. And we don't need some sort of other person coming in and telling us to do that. They need to tell us what are the major things this thing has to do and by when, and we need to figure out how to make that happen. That's what it pay engineers for. Yeah. 
so like a summary would be like a, a partnership over a, a feature factory uh, <laughs> relationship, right? Right. Yeah. Not a feature factory. Yeah, I had a follow up question on that. In that, uh, how how was the decision making? Because it, you know, from what your descriptions are, and uh, what I've seen in some of your books is, um, it's almost like the lines aren't necessarily blurred, right? There was still the controller kind of in the team, but it was more everyone oh, working together. How was it every, decided with all those different hats on what's the next member thing of the, team. the team? Yeah, what's that? Every member of the team makes decisions every hour of every day. Mm. And the critical thing is, how do they know that the decisions they're making, lots and lots of small decisions, are the right ones? Mm. And it is fundamentally a question of, is this decision going to have a, make an improvement to the outcomes that we're after? Is it going to um, make the impact of the work we're doing as a group better? Back in the case with 3M, everybody understood the PL and they understood how the decisions that they made from their specialty impacted that PL. Yep. And um, they understood how it, decisions made across different groups impacted the um, costs and benefits that the other groups would find in improving the PL. So Everybody has to understand the impact of what they're doing from the uh, perspective of the outcomes and impacts that uh, the whole group has been put together to achieve. Yeah, and I, I'd like to address the, what's the controller's job, okay? So when you're trying to get funding in any company and you wanna to put together a rationale which is based on financial numbers, Nobody's going to believe anybody but a controller, right? They're the ones who, whose job it is to understand if this material costs this much and this material costs this much and that costs this much and they put together a p &L. Nobody else is allowed to. Okay, you can understand how it goes together, but if it isn't put together by a person whose job it is to be a controller, at least at that time, then it wasn't considered serious. Stop. It wasn't something you could present to a management team. But if a controller presented it, you know, somebody went through and asked all the questions and take into account all of the various stuff and had a valid financial forecast. So their job was to add credibility and validity to the financial forecast and ask people like the engineers tough questions about, is this cost going to stay the same over time? Is it going to change? Are you going to change it? So their job was not to decide if stuff was uh, going to be profitable. Their job was to, to gather the numbers from the various groups and put it into a, 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 a believable package that everybody up and down a management chain would believe was a true financial projection. Um, and let's take another team member that um, people often confuse because I thought the other half of what we want to talk about was the um, the system engineer or the uh, single threaded leader. So we had a mantra at 3M, if you don't have a champion, you don't have a product. And I was a product champion for a few times. And let me tell you a few things about product champions. The first thing about a product champion is the reason why you have to have one is because you need somebody who really, really cares. It's what they breathe day and night to get that product on the market. They love the idea of it. They want it to be on the market. They care about the product. And, um, uh, you know, we were working with a, a small company in Norway called Iterate. They're in Oslo. And they switched from being a consulting firm to being a startup incubator. And we were working with them a few times over the years as they were trying to make that switch. And I remember one time we, we would go in and we'd look at the stuff that they had in incubation. And... Um, for the third time, they presented us a, a uh, thing that was still in incubation and nothing had happened. And so I said, well, where is the passionate person who cares to get this on the market? And they said, well, it's right over there. It was one of the founders, Kim. And I said, Kim, you can't be the champion for this. You're trying to run a company. You're too busy to care about this product. And he looked at me like, 
huh? Sure enough, that's why it's not moving. And he actually turned over his job as being in, in a senior position in the company and completely took that thing over. And within six months, it started to take off. Just because you need somebody who's got the vision and the passion to make it happen. On the other hand, anybody who really wants something to happen and can't do it themselves knows better than to think that they can tell people what to do. Okay, that doesn't make stuff happen. People are not engaged if they're not thinking for themselves. If you really need the smarts and intelligence of five different uh, you know, types of people that have different kinds of expertise, then your whole job is to figure out how to make them enthusiastic about your product and how to give them ownership of their part of it and make them care about making it successful. That's the whole job of a champion. And that's what Kim added when he got on that product, same people, but he had this vision and this passion about it that he could transmit to the other people and then they could make it happen. So um, when a champion is working with a team that's working on their product, the last thing that they would do would be to tell the team what to do. <clears throat> I mean, that's just like not a concept. At yeah. Toyota, there is a, for every single automobile line, there's a chief engineer. Mm. And the chief engineer is always technical because it's a very technical product. And the chief engineer's job is to envision what that product is going to be in the marketplace. That means they have to get some marketing information and that sort of thing, and then take that vision and plant it in the heads of the people who are going to put the car together. And, um, and, and as there are tensions in that process of never put a new product together that doesn't involve tensions between different disciplines, that's just good products actually are born of certain amounts of tension that are resolved. <coughs> the chief engineer job is not to solve the problem. It's to figure out how to present the problem in front of the group so that they can negotiate a, the best possible solution to it. And so the chief engineer's or product champion job is to be sort of like the CEO of a startup. Mm. The CEO of a startup does not try to do the jobs of the key technical key areas that, that are on his or her team. The CEO tries to assemble a great team and give them ownership of their area and make sure that <clears throat> the vision of what they're trying to do is coherent and moves forward and gets funding. That sort of thing. So that role is also completely missing from Agile. Yeah, I had a follow-up question on that one. And uh, I really like this idea of a champion. And I think I've, I've seen two different uh, versions of it. And I'm interested in your commentary, uh, both of yours commentary on it. So I've kind of seen, uh, maybe I'm stealing this language improperly, but like uh, de facto versus de jure versions of the champion, right? You know, so like, uh, someone who is assigned or like officially titled. Well, no, you can't be assigned. Uh, oh, you can't. You know, oh, so. I mean, okay. Remember, the fundamental thing is passion uh, for the product. Right. It's theoretically possible to be assigned for to something and then gain passion. All right, but not practical. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What you're trying to find is somebody who really deeply cares about making this happen. So typically, the champion has been the one that started out with the vision. It's sort of like, can you assign a CEO of a startup and expect the same results as the founders? There is a time when you have to move from on from the, the you know, initial vision and maybe have new CEOs come in, but not during the startup phase, not when you're trying to make it happen. You need to have somebody who has passion, who cares, who really has a vision of what it's supposed to be and wants to make that happen. That's what the product champion did. We didn't always have product champions for existing longstanding products, but we always had champions for new products, always. Is that yeah. something where, um, so, so you know, you talk about like the startup phase and, and champions and I've seen literature, uh, for example, I think um, Valve talks a lot about uh, this idea that anybody can form a team on a product and just start talking about it and engineers will join them in, in that effort. 
Um, That's how we and, did it at 3M for many new products. Not yeah, all, so, so it's just a natural self-organizing. I'm going to champion this thing and people who hear me talk it, about it. Ain't, it, it ain't like natural it. and it ain't self-organizing. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I've been there. I've yeah, yes. been a champion, first of all. Yes. You have to be passionate about what you're trying to do. Yes. And then you have to sell your idea to engineers. Yes. You okay. have to make them care. So, so I'm, and you've got I'm, a lot of busy people. Yeah. So I'm passionate. Do I go to a controller and say, uh, I have this idea, here's where it is, or it's I'm passionate, this is the idea, and then people come to me, or or how how does it um well what's just um, the mechanic as I built up a team around something called light fiber? Okay. Okay, I had one of the best innovators in the company ever. His name is Roger Epidorn, as sort of my my mentor. And um we would, uh, we had an idea for a fiber, acrylic fiber that would transmit light. And we would go around and talk to various people and say, hey, isn't this cool? And, and we would go to areas where they would have technology that might be relevant. And so for, for instance, we go to the, um, the place where they're trying to do ultimate research on ultra pure polymers. And we found a couple of guys who were working in the research area but of course, remember, all you want to do ever is become engaged in a successful product, but they're in research. So they, you present and say, hey, I'm going to have this team that's going to try to make this product and put it on the market. Would you like to join us? Mm. And they would, they, would, they would see an opportunity to possibly make concrete the research that they're doing. And by the way, if you happen to be the product champion, you make sure they own that whole area of theirs. You don't even touch it. They get to do whatever they want with their ultimate pure polymers or their process to make it or anything like that. Mm. You, you get the team together and you get those people together with some people who really care about the quality part or the manufacturing part. You got to find them. You got to go out and talk about your product and say how interesting it is and find somebody who jumps up and down and says, boy, I'd like to be a part of that. And, and because they have permission to spend up the 20% of their time and whatever they care about, it gets them away from their day job every so often into something that they can. And if you can make that really fun, I had this team together for three solid years mm -hmm. and uh, we put product on the market and, and um, it was enjoyable. We had meetings at seven 30 every Wednesday morning and everybody, we had them because everybody had other jobs. So they had to come in early mm -hmm. and it started out with five people, 10 people ended up with about 30 every single time. And we, we fed on each other. I mean, people went around and talked about what they were doing and how cool it was. And, and we put up demos for the company. We did all sorts of cool stuff. So if you think about light fiber, yeah, you can put colored light through it. Yeah. And you can have a color wheel. So think about like neon, only you can hold it as plastic. Mm -hmm. Well, boy, we could do some really cool demos. Yeah. And when we, I had quarterly meetings with the, the second level boss of every single person on the team invited every quarter. And they would, team would put together a demo and we'd start out the meeting this way. I'd say, hey, have we ever done cool stuff for the last quarter? And um, here's some of the interesting inventions that we've made. And then I would induce, introduce one guy who would come up and say the kind of advancements he made in polymer development and another guy come up and say about the really cool stuff he's done in, in, in process of making it and, and so on. And they got to report to their boss's boss all of the really cool stuff that they were doing, really motivating. And I spent a lot of time thinking, how do I motivate these people to really care about this product? It's not easy and it, it, it's a different kind of a job, but it sure as heck, the, you know, the day I start telling somebody what to do, I'm gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're out of there. They don't want to ever talk to me again. Nobody on those kinds of teams was assigned. Oh, well, there were a few. I had a few people reporting directly to me. But that's the concept is um, you want to have the people who are working on it really enjoy it and really be engaged in it. So, um, so was that 20% time, the time focused on innovation activities? It was a loose number. Yeah, and the eight. The said if you found percent. something else you wanted to do besides your regular job, yeah, you you did not have to account for that time. You could yeah. go work on something else. Had to be something relevant to the company. Mm -hmm. Okay, couldn't be just mm -hmm. like anything, and it it couldn't it 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 was sort of a cap. Yeah, 
it, it was never a mandatory thing. It was sort of a cap on how much you got away with unless you talked to your boss and, and got to spend more. <laughs> I mean, if you're doing polymer research and this particular product furthers your research, maybe yeah. you're spending half your time on it, okay? Yeah, so yeah. it's it was very fluid, um, but it was really for all new products a matter of getting people excited and engaged about it and making them own their area and be proud of their work and able to brag about it. Give them, yeah. me, I spend my time figuring out how to give people bragging rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, oh. that's, I, I really love that. And um, so, so like the other, the, the other percentage of their time, their normal job, is that working on established products or? or well, in my case, I had an awful lot of people that were in the research department. Okay. So basically they were taking their research and bringing it to practical. Productizing it. Right. I remember um, I wanted, uh, I had an intern who had just started working and she was there for the summer and she was really good. And um, she was the kind of person, she'd come into the team. She's very junior, but she could, she would listen. And at the end of the meeting, anything that came up had to have a separate meeting to resolve. We never resolve problems at mean. And she would like figure out how to help everybody organize meetings, collect data from meetings and stuff like that. She was really good. So my boss and I went to the head of one of the research departments and said, so Cheryl is really good. She's going to be a wonderful employee. And you happen to have a rec to hire people. So here's the deal. I said to this, you hire Cheryl, let her report to me for two years and I will give you a completely trained researcher that knows how to do new product development. And he says, okay. And I got Cheryl full time. And that was the deal. And believe me, by the end of that two years, she became really a top researcher that had a whole lot of experience with product development. So that's how we got people. I mean, you had to be a little bit wild, but so let's, let's talk about a little bit different concept. Another one that, um, the, in addition to the senior engineer and basically really good successful products almost always have this concept of chief engineer. You see it in like GE Healthcare has the concept of a chief engineer. Um, lots of products have this chief engineer that's the sort of champion for the product that also understands technical. If your product is technical, that's the replacement for a product manager. You typically don't really always have product managers and chief engineers. You have product manager for consumer oriented products and chief engineers for very technical products. And at Tesla, for example, you don't have product engineers, but you have chief engineers for various, say, components of not, not Tesla, say SpaceX. You have chief engineers for various components of a, a rocket, for example. And um, what they call their chief engineers is the responsible engineer. And the responsible engineer is the one who's responsible to make sure that that particular component, whether it's an engine or a, you know, a booster or you name it, and uh, legs that are gonna land on the craft, that it works. And you know what the role of your you know, leg, landing leg is. And you, you know that the next blast off is five months down the stream. And you do everything you can to make sure that the leg works five months from now because it's going to blast off whether you like it or not. And you have the responsibility for making it work. And so they work on the principle of responsible engineer at lots and lots of levels. So a responsible engineer can have like responsible engineers for their subcomponents too. Now, if, if you look at Amazon, they have a slightly different thing, and it's not anything like the way we did at 3M. They have a concept, you know, they used to call these the, their teams two pizza teams, small teams. That's the way they started because Bezos, uh, somebody told Bezos that in about 2000, 2001, that, you know, everything is, everything was like going out of control. They had a monolithic front end and a monolithic back end and they could not keep up. So they bought a bigger computer and they could not keep up even more. So uh, they said to him, well, you know, we just have to communicate better. And he said, oh, that's nonsense. I'm like, if we can't communicate now, if you can imagine the way I'd like to see this company grow, we're never gonna be able to communicate enough. There has to be something different. And he had a belief 
that the best way to grow massive size was to have a lot of independent agents making independent decisions. So he said, you know, we don't have to communicate more, we have to communicate less. So we should have teams that are like two pizzas, you can feed them two pizzas at lunch and that's the size of the team, you know, six, eight, 10 people max. And that's how many teams, we, the size of our teams and they should be able to operate independently. And that worked well for software. But there's this book called Working Backwards by a couple of the early executives. It's published maybe three or four years ago. And, uh, and what it says in that is it worked. They said that worked, but it only worked in software. It didn't work in other areas. So we tried some more things and we ended up with a different concept. It was similar, but it was different. What we found with lots of research and data and experiments was the biggest predictor of a successful team was a single threaded leader. So what is a single threaded leader? A single threaded leader is a person who has nothing else to do but make a thing successful. Remember when I told Kim, you can't both be the, a senior executive in the company and run this business? It was the same concept. Yeah. If he wasn't only focusing on running that new business, it wasn't enough of him. And so what Amazon does, I mean, think about it. Amazon is putting new services on the market of like rate of about once a month. Enterprise category class services every month for like 10 years. They've just grown astronomically. I've not seen anything like their software growth anywhere else. And they do it with these relatively small teams. But the way that it works is that the team has a person who has the responsibility to make something happen. And they have the authority and the capability and the knowledge and all of that to hire or put together whatever team they want to make it happen. Now that might have involved sub teams and this might be you know, fractal, but the concept is that every service has a single threaded leader, somebody whose job it is to make whatever that service is supposed to do happen. And always the service is defined in terms of customer outcomes. Yeah. So yeah. in some way. So they define, we need this kind of an outcome yep. and, uh, and put together a team and make it happen. Both the team leader and the team have nothing else to do but that. Nothing else to do. So single threaded means one thread. Yeah. And they found that a single threaded leader was the key to making sure that stuff happened and got done. Yeah. And it got done right. And it got done the way people happened, wanted. When uh, the guy who's the launch director at SpaceX was interviewed on how things work at, at SpaceX, he said that we work on the principle of responsibility. So they have responsible engineers at multiple levels. There is no other engineering process known ever that is more effective at making the right thing happen and happen well and effectively than the principle of responsibility. So um, we've done too aggressive at avoiding responsibility in Agile. And if you look at those two companies and you look at 3M, you have the responsible leader and the responsible leader is not responsible to tell people what to do, because if they really want to be successful, they can't. That doesn't work. If you know how people work, they don't work when you tell them what to do. Kids don't, and you know, adults don't either. They only work when you figure out how to make it attractive for them to do something, which is a way bigger challenge than telling them what to do. And so if you look at, in those cases, and also my experience at 3M, somebody responsible for making something happen that can collect the people necessary and have them focus on only that is the way that they get all these services done. It's their, it's their secret. It's their, you know, it's their nice. secret sauce. Nice. And, and so this concept of having somebody responsible is exactly what Agile has tried to get away from. Mm. We don't want any scrum master having any responsibility. Like, why not? What's wrong with responsibility? Oh, well, then they just tell people what to do. No, no, they don't. 
So there is an, a mistaken idea about what responsibility means. And therefore, I've seen 20 years of running away from responsibility. And you can't talk about leaders unless they're servant leaders. No, I talk about passionate leaders, not servant leaders. Ah, leaders okay. who are passionate about what they're trying to achieve and can transmit that passion to the people that they bring in to make it happen. And they're focused on making it happen. So if, uh, even despite like at 3M, it was usually very often new products were a, a side job. At, at Amazon, new services are a full-time job with nothing to distract. Yeah. But that's where they differ widely. But where they're the same is that they have a responsible leader. And if you look at the companies that again and again make stuff happen and make stuff happening astoundingly well, you'll find this concept of having a responsible leader making it happen. And those are the two things that I think Agile has gotten wrong. The concept of direct concept between the team and the customers for outcomes and direct feedback to decide what to do based on outcomes and the responsible, the responsible leader. And if we could just like rethink why we ran away from those ideas. Yeah. <laughs> we every, could probably do better. Every member of the team is a volunteer, whether they're paid to do the work or not. The yeah. great resignation that we're all enjoying these days um, drives that home. Mm -hmm. um, everybody doing this kind of work is a volunteer. So you have to manage them. You have to lead them. You yeah. have to give them the enthusiasm that they want to volunteer. Mm -hmm. You can't force them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, lo I love that. I love that concept. And, you know, speaking of post-its, I have a whole slew of uh, post-it follow-up questions, but we are uh, at time. So, uh, uh, so I don't know if we're going to, uh, you know, I, I love the thoughts. I love the conversation. And uh, so maybe we'll have a part two. We'll see. Um, but uh, we're, we're at our time box. So is there anything you'd like to quickly summarize before we uh, close out the show? Passion makes all the difference. Leaders evoke passion. Yeah. Well, I'd like to summarize. And Agile did a lot of good, but it's not the end. If you are not constantly improving on the way things are doing, and you think you can make it in the software industry, you have to, you have to you're wrong because anything that's 10 years old is pretty close to obsolete, no matter what you personally think. Mm. And 20 years old and it's hopelessly out of date. You're missing <laughs> something if you cling to something that was really cool 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, even five. The idea is to constantly improve and mm -hmm. constantly challenge yourself to what's the next thing? What am I missing? Um, really good companies are companies that constantly learn. Nice. Nice. Fantastic. Yeah. Continuous learning. I love it. Well, thank you uh, both for being on the show and, uh, yeah. So to our audience, if there's, uh, you know, anybody you'd like to share with about, you know, minimizing outputs and maximizing outcomes and leadership and agile and how that all works. Uh, yeah. Please share this episode. Please like, and subscribe. Uh, we love the feedback. Speaking of feedback, <laughs> I love getting feedback uh, in any, any way we can through, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and more. So uh, yeah, keep it coming. We've been loving it. And uh, thank you so much, Mary and Tom. It's been fantastic having you on the show. Great. And uh, yeah, until next time, have a good one, everybody. And bye. Cheers. Bye. bye, -bye.